If Mecca wasn't bad enough, what about the Hijaz? Mecca and Medina? What do the scholars say about that? You'd like to know. Stay tuned. Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi. And as always, uh, we are honored to have you here following us and uh, tuning in to this fabulous series about creating the Quran, which is named in honor of this book. And I'm going to grab this book for you and show you. Uh, the book is by Dr. Stephen Shoemaker. This is it right here. It's called Creating the Quran. And myself and Dr. Jay Smith, who is with me here in studio, we've been unpacking a lot of material out of this amazing book, scholarly book, of course. And we are highlighting for you the fact that Dr. Shoemaker, who is quoting other scholars, there is something in their conclusions related to the origin of the Quran and Islam altogether. Last time we talked about, for instance, Mecca or the Mecca dilemma. This time I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Hijaz region where Mecca and Yathrib and other prominent cities exist. With me here, of course, to discuss all of this is our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. Dr. Jay, welcome back as always. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Yeah. Now we're moving into the wider area, not just Mecca. We're asking about the bigger area of Central Arabia. Uh, and there, the scholars do have opinions on this. Haunting refers to this uh, in, in his book in 2018, which has just come out not too, too long ago. And I'm going to quote what he says, because he says that, there have, that even the Islamic traditions say that there was a change, uh, that the text was changed that the, what we have today is not the original Quran. So that suggests that something was happening at a later. But let's just see what he says here. Concerning when the Quran was entirely written, uh, the Islamic tradition's own account of the early history of the Quran tells us of the existence and destruction to various texts. We know this. We've done this in a previous episode. We talked about al-Buhari and Sahih Muslim and Ibn Daud and Tirmidhi, where they talk about parts of the Quran have been lost. Some have been changed. Others have been deleted. We even saw, talk about the reference uh, to parts of it have been eaten by the goat, uh, the, the reference to uh, the, 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 that you have to suckle, a woman has to suckle a male when she comes to visit him in her house. So these are well known within the Islamic traditions. That's what Adi is referring to. If this is so, and they're admitting this in the early centuries, 9th and 10th century here, here. The Islamic tradition's own account of the early history of the Quran tells us of the existence, destruction to variant texts. It talks about Al Buhari refers to this in volume six, hadith number 509, especially hadith number 510, where um, Uthman burns, completely burns manuscripts that don't agree with the Qureshi text that he has commissioned, uh, he has commissioned Zaid ibn Tabi to write. Acknowledge that the text of the Quran as we have it bears no relation to, to the order in which it was revealed to Muhammad. It is implicit, therefore, he says, that the Quran would look rather different if it had been compiled and put into order by the Prophet himself. So what he's saying is it's obvious that there, there has been a manipulation, even though even the traditions admit this, that there has been changes, deletions, accretions, corruptions, and also burnings. If that is the case, then folks, why are we even disputing this since we need to, to question this from their own traditions? Schumacher even goes on one step further, but he wants to then talk about what he had said earlier about Mecca. He then broadens to the whole problem of the Hijaz. And he's saying that, hold on a minute, there was no literacy at that time. The only material that we have from that period is oral. And this is what he says. Concerning the linguistic history of ancient Arabia, according to the most recent and authoritative scholarship on this subject, the cultures of both Mecca and, and Yathrib, Yathrib is the name that was given before Medina, that's the more modern name, but Medina, Medina just means city, as well as the surrounding settlements of pre-Islamic Hijaz, were despite the existence of various systems of writing, fundamentally non-literate at all, no literature at that time. This means that insofar as we seek to understand the Quran, we must at the same time recognize its status as a fundamentally oral text that developed within a broader cultural context that also was fundamentally oral. I'm gonna get back to orality later on, but I'm introducing that at this stage because Shoemaker is gonna talk quite a bit about orality. Nonetheless, what you see what he's saying. There is no literate, literature, liter, literist or literal background this early, that far south. Well, if you only have a few hundred people living there anyways, and you don't even have a script yet, because the script that you would have used would have been Aramaic, Syro-Aramaic, uh, uh, 
uh, Nabataean Aramaic, which would be Jordan and Syria, and even that is only con controlled by the Christians, and there are no Christians in the Hejaz. You can see that why there's no literature. And you remember, these are Bedouins. These are people who would not have any need for literature because they're always moving, and they're a lot of oral, yes, a lot of orality. They're singing their songs, they're singing their praises, and they're passing down their traditions orally. Oral tradition is quite rampant in that area. That we do understand, and that's what Shoemaker is saying. But he continues, and he says the seventh century Hijaz, literacy in the early seventh century Hijaz was in fact extremely rare and almost completely unknown, to such a degree that we must conceive the formation of Muhammad's new religious movement and its sacred text within a context that was non-literate and fundamentally oral. Okay, half of that I agree with, the other half I don't. You can see where I'm gonna go with this because you know where I come from. He's already assuming that Muhammad has something to do with this. I think that he's got a problem here, but we'll, let's hold that to aside for now. We'll come back to that at a later time. So what did exist? What exactly was there? Was there any literature? Yes, there was. And what is it? Rock inscriptions, not texts on a page. There are no manuscripts. There's no parchment. Remember when we talked about parchment? Parchment are animal skins. You have to be wealthy. You have to be rich. You have to be an emperor. You have to be a caliph. You have to be a bishop uh, in a monastery to be able to start using parchment because each page takes parts of an animal skin, and that only the Christians had at that time. And you had to be, you, it takes an awful lot of animal skins to write anything as size of the Quran, which is about the size of our New Testament. Mm -hmm. So he was saying the writing that did exist was used primarily for recreation. And what it is, is we find it, is primarily the form of graffiti on rocks. Many times the graffiti was prayers. Uh, Ilke Linstad, who we talked about earlier in one of our earlier uh, episodes. We talked about Ilke Linstad, who's done the best work between 640 and 740. So 640 would be after Muhammad's death, immediately after Muhammad, if Muhammad had lived, up until the, the, just the end of the Umayyad dynasty. So it includes almost the, all of the entirety of the Umayyad dynasty. He looked at all the inscriptions and he noticed all, immediately that in the seventh century, all of the inscriptions are way up in the north, in what is today Syria, what is today Jordan, what is today Lebanon, and then over in the east, uh, what is today Iraq, and what is today Iran. That's where the inscriptions are. There are some inscriptions down in the south, in Yemen. Nothing whatsoever in the Hejaz, which makes sense because there's not, first of all, there's just not any literature at that time. They're not literate. Why would they be even chiseling out on the rocks something that they can't even do? If that were the case, then they would be quite literate. They would, they, they would sing their stories. They would tell their stories. They would pass it on tradition to, uh, 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 one generation after another. That makes sense, but not a scripture and certainly nothing of this size or this sophistication, not that far south. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's it's really interesting, and I mean, he he raises up a lot of excellent points here. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, even Islam claims that uh, when Islam came into being, it was called the age of ignorance. Ignorance. I mean, you're dealing with obviously people that uh, had no knowledge of things and so on and so forth. So. Uh, it makes no sense to all of a sudden discover that, oh, they were sophisticated in writing and sophisticated in, uh, 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 you know, ornamentation and sophisticated in so many other things. No, absolutely. Yeah. You've got to, and that's why we have always said, if you're going to talk about history, talk about history on the ground. Show me the evidence. We've always said this. Uh, we've said, you've said it. I demand this of my sin sifters. Keep to the evidence on the ground. Put out suppositions, but be able to support it historically. Otherwise, you're just talking hot air. And we have to be careful that we don't do that. We put out uh, white papers, don't we? And a lot of the white right. papers are always supported by historical evidence. And I've said categorically, when we're talking about the three major categories, the book, the man, and the place, the book, the Quran, the man, Muhammad, and the place, Mecca, for heaven's sakes, don't waste my time with ninth and 10th century material redacted back onto the seventh century. Tell me what was happening in those three areas in the seventh century. Then we have a discussion. So what are we talking about next? Well, then if this is the case, if it couldn't have happened in Mecca, if it couldn't happen in Medina, if it couldn't happen in the Hijaz, where then do they say the Quran actually was written? I wanna see what they come to. They do have conclusions. That's next. And that's a fair question to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. This is Al Fadi, over and out, God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell 
so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.